Hello everyone, thank you for joining me in worship today. Let's start worship with a call to worship from Psalm 70. This is Psalm 70, verse 4. May all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say evermore, God is great. Let's worship. so easily and often charmed by the world's delights. And charmed is such a good word for it. We do not intend to wander, but we get easily distracted. Forgive us from seeking fulfillment apart from you. Forgive us for lifting up simple pleasures in life to places of worship. We sometimes confuse the creation with the creator. So please let all the delights and pleasures in the world point us back to the one who created them in the first place. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Let's read Colossians 1, 15 through 20. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the one who is first over all creation, because all things were created by him, both in heaven and on earth, the things that are visible and the things that are invisible. Whether they are thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. He existed before all things, and all things are held together in him. He is the head of the body, the church, the one who is the firstborn from among the dead so that he might occupy the first place in everything. Because all the fullness of God was pleased to live in him, and he reconciled all things to himself through him, whether things on earth or in the heavens. He brought peace through the blood of his cross. trials here trusting in 
The Father's wise bestowment I have no cause for worry or for fear He who sought his kind beyond all measure Gives unto each day what he deems best Lovingly it's part of is near me with a special mercy for each hour all my cares he fain would bear and cheer me he whose name is counselor and power the protection of his child and treasure the chart that on himself he laid as thy days thy strength shall be in measure this the pledge to me he has made So to trust thy promises, O Lord, that I lose not faith, sweet consolation offered me within thy holy word. Help me, Lord, when toil and trouble meeting, uh, to take as from a father's hand one by one the day the moment fleeting till i reach the promised land shelter from the stormy blast and our eternal home under the shadow of thy throne thy saints have dwelt secure sufficient is thy That ends the night before the rising sun. Oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. Be 
for us on the cross. You have proved that you are for us in our redemption, and you will prove that you are for us every day. We thank you that your love for us is unshakable. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Hey, thanks for tuning in this week's online message. We're still in our Prayer Matters series, and we're starting to come to a little bit more of a close. And so we're starting to wrap stuff up probably another week or so. It just depends on, on how these scriptures lay out here for the next few weeks. But it's been a really challenging series. I think we're on week six now. And it's all been rooted in Psalm 145 verses 18 and 19 and this is what it says it says the lord is near to all who call on him to all who call on him in truth that he fulfills the desires of those who fear him he also hears their cry and saves them and so i really wanted to mold a teaching around seeking god in our life for the answers and the only way we're going to be able to do that is in prayer and with that aspect of it my hope in this series has been that you would increase in prayer with more time, more intentionality, and more specifically. And so I hope that you've done that. I hope that it's challenged you to look at your prayers. I've asked you to track them in this time to see whether or not you're praying more on a, on a heavier side for healing, more on a heavier side for, for individual needs, whether or not you pray more for others, whether or not you have a balanced prayer. Because ultimately what we're dealing with here is the model a prayer that Jesus gave his disciples and he's given us. And so I shared that we're going to break down the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6 every single week, verse by verse. And so we've done that. And I want to just read it as a whole because I think it's really good just to sit in the model for a minute. So let me just read that to you. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we have also forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, the first week we really talked about not breaking down that first verse of the Lord's Prayer, but having our heart righted in the Lord so that our heart was in the right spot. And I challenged everyone in tracking our prayers, evaluating what we were praying, so that you would know exactly where your heart was through this as we started. And hopefully, if needed, be able to adjust and let the Lord work in your life to adjust your heart to be able to be ready for the model that he's asked for each and every one of us. And then the second week, we started going verse by verse, and it's our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name is the idea of, of praise and thanksgiving and that we would put the Lord in his rightful place in our life and in our hearts before we start that prayer. So as we pray, it would be the idea of, oh Lord, and placing him where he's supposed to be in our life first. Acknowledging that, praising him for who he is, thanking him for the, who he is, and then going into the rest of where our prayers are. And then the week after that, we did your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And those, that's where we really, it was about his kingdom, not ours. And it's about kingdom requests, not our requests. But then the next week, we got into give us this day our daily bread. And this is where we really spend our time asking for what we need and also for the needs of others. And this is where our time of petition comes into that model of prayer. And last week we talked about forgive us our debts as we have forgiven those who have debts against us. And we, we really discussed and discovered the need of forgiveness in our life. That oftentimes we want to sweep things under the rug. Sometimes we say we forgive and we actually haven't. Um, not only ourselves, not only asking and confessing to the Lord for that forgiveness, but even 
forgiving others for what they've done to us, but also to pray for the forgiveness of others as, as a corporate, as interceding. And we, we talked about how in verse 14 and 15 was very clear when Jesus said that our Father will not forgive us if we do not forgive those who have sinned against us. And that's about as clear as it gets. And that's very difficult because I want the grace of God in my life, but I don't get that grace and forgiveness if I don't choose to forgive those that I need to forgive that maybe hurt me in that time, whatever that looks like. But it was also a need to intercede for others as well in that, that we would pray for that forgiveness for their life, whether we were a part of the sins or not, whether they're sins of omission, which would mean things like, um, I didn't do what God had commanded me to do. Maybe I didn't share the gospel in the time that I should have. I didn't help someone needy at the time. Um, those are those sins of omissions. But then we also have the ones where we know we have sinned against others or others have sinned against us. And we need to confess and repent. We need to forgive and show mercy. And we need to be able to move past that. And so that leads us to where we are today. And the next verse is, and then do not lead us into temptation, but to deliver us from evil. And so this is one that I want to talk about for a minute on the idea of us as human beings. But before I do that, I want to ask you, how do you catch a mouse? I mean, there's all kinds of traps and different things, but I want to talk about the idea of like poison. There's a particular poison called decon, which I think most people know. And the reason I want to talk about it is decon itself is roughly 99% food, mouse food, and one, about roughly 1% poison. Now, of course, you would never catch a mouse if you just put out a huge bowl of poison. No matter how you decorated the rest, you just put out this huge poison and say, here you go. Like they, they're not drawn to it without it being masked, which is why it's masked by the food. That's why most of it is all food and a small bit of it is poison. You know, the idea of trapping is, is figuring out what appeals to what it is you're trying to trap to be able to draw them in. And in this case, when you deal with mice, it means their stomachs, it's their food. That's what they're oftentimes looking for. So the stomachs of the mice, as they eat, what will slowly actually become their undoing in life. And not only is the poison itself deadly, but it's also patient. And what I mean by that is, is it, it, it doesn't start working until later. And so the mouse itself doesn't understand that it's the food that got it. And that's important because when you look at it, it's not going to blame the food. And the others aren't going to notice that it ate and died that it slowly died because of what it ate and it dies later, I think that there would be something in it that would blame other things, that it would think of other things. And it, it essentially becomes killed by its own desire. And I think we're a lot like vice. So we have desires in our life, and if we're not careful, we can be killed by our own desires. But in that, we look for sources of other things to be the reason that we have those demises in our life. If you want to follow along, we'll be in James chapter 1, verses 13 through 18. The book of James, first part of chapter 1, talks about how, how trials are going to just happen in life. Like, you don't have a choice. And then it gets into this idea of temptation. And that's where I want to, I want to spend some time. Because as, as the mice would eat things that they knew would be food, not realizing there's poison in it, Essentially, they're slowly eating their demise. We can end up eating our demise in our desires of life if we don't understand the root of those desires. And that's what I want to talk about today because that's temptation that falls into our life that we have to deal with. Here in the book of James, verses 13 through 18, chapter 1, it says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be kind 
of first fruits of his creation. So this helps us to see that, that God is not the one who entices us into sin. And I know there's a lot of times as believers will say, you know, I know God doesn't entice me and God doesn't attempt, but we still, there's still things in our desires and the rest where we want to shift that. You know, the, the fact is, is our own natures make us to have this sin that is enticing. And, and that's difficult for us to be able to work through because thankfully God is gracious enough that he's here to be able to change our nature. And that's what I want to talk about today is our nature. Because when we look at this bit in, in the scripture of, and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil, we have evil in us. We have evil desires. We have evil thoughts. We have evil actions at times. And and those are desires in our life. They're, they're the places where we've fallen into temptation because that evil, that sin, is just disobedience to the Lord. And that can be a lot of different things. It doesn't even have to hurt others. It can just hurt our relationship and separation before the Lord. And if you don't think that's hurt, you need to spend some more time in prayer wondering why that is because it is. We shouldn't ever want sin in our life. But we did talk about last week how even the pillar of faith, our Apostle Paul says, why is it that I know what is right and I still do what is wrong? And I know what is wrong, but I, I, I have trouble doing what is right. It, it's, it's that flesh and, and spirit division that we have that we have to fight against. And so it's important for us to not just know in our mind, but know in our heart that God does not entice us to sin. That first part of James talks about how inevitably, inevitably, we're going to go through trials, struggles, hard times, testings, the whole nine yards. And this part, when we get into verse 13, it pretty much tells us that inevitably we're all going to be tempted. And we're going to continue to be tempted throughout our life. So what do we need to do to be able to overcome that for our nature? Well, we are tempted to shift our blame for our temptation. And some will say, well, no, I'm, I, I'll accept our pattern as people in general, I'm not saying maybe every individual, but the pattern of people as man and as woman, there is a pattern for us to shift our blame when we fall into temptation or even when we are tempted. And we can see that because if you look in Genesis 3 and you look about how Adam and Eve are walking in the garden with the Lord and the Lord leaves and the serpent comes and God only asks one thing. You can partake of everything here except for the one tree in the middle of the garden, the one that will give you the wisdom of good and evil. And do not eat from that because if you do, you will surely die. Those, those are his commands to them. And he's clear in that. He says, do not eat from it or you will surely die. And so along comes Satan as a serpent and he whispers in Eve's ear. And he says, did God really say that? So he just twisted the words to get her thinking. And in her mind, she has a desire. He literally says, he, he doesn't want you to eat it because if you do, you will become like God. And there's so many things in people's lives where they want to be like God or they want to be the God of their life or God of certain things. And, and that temptation took over, and that temptation comes in. And so he leaves, they eat, and they sin. And they, they instantly realize something's different, and they're naked. And so they hide from the Lord. And so the Lord comes in looking for them. And this is where we pick up in Genesis 3, and he says here in verse 11, God said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree at which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, the woman who you gave to me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. And then the Lord said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. So here, what do we see? We see that pattern of shifting the blame in the temptation. Adam said it was Eve's fault. Eve said it was Satan's fault. And in the end, when you really sit in it, it's us as individuals that make the willful decision in our free will to sin or not. No one makes us do it. 
we decide to make a decision in those moments. And if we're not careful, we can make a decision to even blame the Lord. Proverbs 19.3 says, When a man's folly brings his way to ruin, his heart rages against the Lord. I don't want my heart to rage against the Lord, but I've known people who said, if there was really a God, he wouldn't allow this to happen. God, if you were really here, why would you allow this evil to happen? Why don't you stop this? Why don't you stop that? And my common answer is, is this is not the world that God had intended. That sin in Genesis 3 created a ripple effect that changed everything that costs all of us. With the evil inside us, our temptations that root in our desires, that's the ripple effect that we get from that one sin of the fall. But we also see in Matthew 7, 1 through 5, it says, Judge not that you may, may be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So why do you see the speck in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is the log in your own eye? See, Jesus is teaching us that we are more likely to look, look at it being someone else's fault than our own. And then scripture says, like, be careful how you judge others because you will be judged with the same measure. And, and the, the log in our eye, like oftentimes what irritates us in other people is some of the very same things that we do in life. And so that we, we have to really check ourselves. And Psalms 130, 39, 23, and 24 says, Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in your way everlasting. Like it's, it's Lord, look at me. What is bad? It's, it's self-assessment. It's, it's sober self-assessment. It's literally looking at myself and knowing with integrity and honesty with the Lord that this is good in me or this is not good in me. Lord, show me and then help me overcome it. Help me to walk in your will. Help me to do what it is that you need me to do. But we also have to understand that God is never the source of our temptation. So if we're shifting blame and that's a pattern of ours, we got to know without a doubt that he cannot be that source of our temptation. God cannot tempt. He cannot tempt anyone to do evil of any kind because it's not in his nature. It's not who he is. It's not his character. Now, this doesn't mean that he's not going to allow trials to happen in our life, that he's not going to not test us. But it does mean he will never entice a person to do evil. And we have to be really sure of that. So if you know something that's being done is evil, that temptation they fell in, that's not from the Lord. Like he will never entice anyone to do anything evil. So when we feel the pull towards sin and rebellion, we are never allowed to shake our fists at God and say, Lord, why did you do that? Why did you make me? You made me this way. Some of the scariest words we could ever say is, this is just the way the Lord made me, or this is the way I am. That doesn't leave room for the very thing that's required in our saving grace, which is to be reborn, which is to be changed, which is to put the old life to bed and to be reborn in this new creation. That all comes down to our nature. We have this nature in us, and our natures make sin enticing. And that's important for us to realize because there are a few things that we need to know about our natures. So just as we, just as with the, the mice that, you know, they would drink and, and the poison of sin and the rest would be enticing, we can be just like them. We can be enticed into these desires, and our desires can lead to us to make the decision to sin. And out of that decision of sin, it actually becomes death. See, temptation comes from within us. It's inside each and every one of us. A wrong desire is an intense longing for that which God has forbidden. Do you have things that you know for a fact God is like, this is sin, don't do it, and you do it? Do you have an addiction? That needs to be dealt with do you have a when i say addiction it can be addiction to media it can be addiction to pornography it can be addiction to relationships and people in an unhealthy manner it could be real it could be addictions to drugs and alcohol and and other things that become life destroyers become gods and idols in your life 
you know, Genesis 3, 6, when they were in the garden, look at how, look at how this comes in and how we know that temptation comes within rather than from the Lord. It says, so when the woman saw that the, the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took off the fruit and ate and she gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. So the temptation is tailored to our own desires. And what I mean is, is, is each of us as a unique person, our desires will be unique at some level. You know, one man might be very tempted by certain things in this world that doesn't tempt another person. I, I have friends that have overcome alcoholism and so for them to be able to go to any place that would sell alcohol and try to share the gospel and the rest, the temptation and the feelings would be too great in those desires for them to be able to be there without wanting or trying to take a drink. But in my life, that's not something that I've actually wrestled with. I don't have a desire to do that or for it to have control over me. So our temptations aren't the same. I can go and I can share the gospel there and I can spend time there and not have that same draw, that same enticing that's there. So, so really, temptation is tailored to our own individual desires at some, some level, the things that we incline to that we know to be wrong. Now, there are positive God-given desires, but that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about the, the, the wrong, evil desires that draw us into the temptation that leads to sin. Because temptation wears a mask. That very word drawn away, or even the word enticed, those are hunting, fishing, trapping terms. So when I take my, my kids fishing and we're out there, like they'll run through the different baits that we have trying to entice the fish. So that way they, they get it to go after it and they get hooked and we can reel them in. When we go hunting, they, they try to draw away one of, one of them from the herd so that we can take a shot and, and be able to, to, to bag the game. It's, a, it's, it's that cat and mouse game. Like it's the idea of trapping and enticing and drawing out and leading them to put them right where you want them to be. That's the mask that temptation does for us as well. It's like, how can I get you? You know, if you have a problem with, with pornography or online stuff, I'm going to get you by yourself. And, and then I have you. And if you have, you know, a drug issue, I'm going to make sure you don't change this friend group because that would, that would mean you'd have a chance to get out of it. These are all the things that draw us in on that bit. And we have to be careful because temptation rarely comes in the form of, of its, its grandchild, really, which is death. What I mean is, is temptation eventually brings forth death. That's what we read in that, in that scripture earlier. What begins as a desire in us, we, we can have a will to overcome that. We can, we can have the strength of the Lord and the Holy Spirit in us to keep us from letting that turn to sin. But the moment that we let that turn to sin and we give over to that, sin fully grows into death. And that's why, that's why sin is death. That's why in the gospel, like we're all destined as lost people to die until we are saved. But in that saving grace, that means the old life has to go away. That means these temptations we need to, we need to, to overcome. And when we fail, that's why we have to confess and repent, ask for forgiveness to receive forgiveness. See, James is urging his readers to not give in to the temptation because it's inevitably going to lead to death in our life. There's no sin in this world that doesn't take us to death because it's separation from the Lord. And thankfully, God is at work to change our natures if we so, so choose. You know, the beauty of that is God can change our nature. We might be born with a sin nature, but he can change that nature in our life. You know, the source of the problem is our desire of nature to, to do things, to rule things, to have things over, to control it. And apart from Christ, we aren't wise enough to be able to see the poison that sin brings. Instead, it's very uh, attractive most of the time. That's why it's a desire. We desire to do it. But truthfully, even if we did see the poison of sin, we'd still rebel at some level 
I mean, how many times do we see that we know something is sin and maybe because we're angry, maybe because we're hungry, maybe because we're lonely, maybe because we're tired, like we sin out of that weakness. And we need to be very careful there because by nature, we hate what we should love and we love what we should hate. I mean, think about laws. I mean, I know so many people who can't stand laws. They're like, oh, all these laws, this or that. And so then when it comes to the Ten Commandments, God's laws, they rebel against it. But you tell me which one of God's laws would ever hurt you if you truly followed them. But yet we struggle to love them. You know, God is in the business of changing our natures, and that's what we want him to do. And that's restoring our desires to be right desires within him. Every good gift comes from a good God. And so God is the creator of this good gift of creation, but God is also the creator of a good gift of new creation. So we can ask for that, because when we give our heart of stone before, and we, we give our life to Christ, he gives us a new soft one. He gives us a new, alive and living one, a heart for him. And God has given the gospel to rescue us from death. So we don't have to worry about it. He changes our desires. He overcomes our death sentence. And apart from grace, we will have a foolish thirst for this poison, this sin in life that everybody just is so drawn to. But thankfully, God has redeemed us from this insatiable hunger for our very own destruction. You know, we are still tempted, but through Christ Jesus himself, sin can lose its luster and we can get past it. We know in James 1, in, in this passage 13 through 18, it's really a call to flee the lure of sin in our life, as well as a call to celebrate this new life that we have in Christ. Do you truly celebrate this new life that you have in Christ? You know, Billy Sunday is a gentleman who once said, The temptation is the devil looking through the keyhole. Yielding is opening the door and inviting him in. You know, it's inevitable that temptations will come to us, but it's not inevitable that we must give in to them when they do. We can draw on the strength of the Holy Spirit, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, to be able to overcome those things. Scripture promises that with temptation... God himself provides us a way out. That's a 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Consider the, the following three experiences that I want to share with you out of the Bible here. These are, these are parts in Scripture where we see serious temptation of desires and God provides a way out. And the very first one that we see is, is back with Adam and Eve. So when we, we look, what do we learn from Eve in that story of her with the serpent and, and wanting the fruit and the rest? She shows us that we need to be strong enough in the truth that we don't believe the lies of the enemy. We can't believe the lies that Satan's going to try and bring because he's crafty. That's what he does. He has schemes. He's trying to trick us. He's trying to get us to fall into that and make that choice of temptation. And we'll try and blame him for it. But the fact of the matter is, it's on us because we made the choice. So we, ha we can't believe Satan's lies. But that means you got to know what the truth really is to be able to battle that. And since the Garden of Eden, we know for a fact that Satan has been waging a battle in our minds. And so his strategy with Eve is where was to put a question mark where God would put an exclamation point. What I mean is, is in that Genesis 3, 1, when he says, did God really say that? Yes, God really did say that. So he puts this question in there, and the devil's tactics, they haven't changed for us today. They still do those things. He attacks by tempting us with questions in the word and the, of the word of God itself and God's very character. Because we know what God's character is. But we can be tricked to remember it at times. We can worry more about ourselves and the rest. The lie of the devil is that we can find greater gratification apart from God. And the fact of the matter is, the truth is, you cannot. The lie is that we can be our own gods. But the fact of the matter is, is we cannot. Don't believe the lies. Don't believe the lies. You know, sin never delivers what it promises, not once. And temptation starts in our mind. That's why, that's why it's so important for us that 
The best way to not allow ourselves to conform to the world's thinking is to take captive those thoughts. It begins by allowing God to transform your mind. And so we have to allow him to do that. Do you know people who won't give their life to Christ because they're stuck in their own minds? Like it doesn't make sense to them, this idea of faith and the rest. Like if I can't feel it, touch it, smell it, see it, it, it can't be real. But I also know people who justify things in their own minds and don't leave room for wisdom. You, you know people in your own life that you know might know all the scriptures, know the commands and what God says, but it's all in their mind. It hasn't worked its way into its heart, in their hearts, to eventually actually come out in their actions for everyone else. You know, the world wants to capture our minds. If we're not careful, we give them to it. And this is important because the Holy Spirit is working within us to change our mind so that we can recognize that God's will is good, is perfect, is pleasing. And we really need to rest in that. Like, why would we not want what's good, what's perfect, and what's pleasing? And God's transformation is his work in our lives. And it's not behavioral modification, it is true transformation. And that's what we want for our lives. But only God can do that, and he can only do it if we're willing to let him. So instead we go on the offensive and use languages of warfare. And we have to be careful because Paul is very clear in 2 Corinthians 10.5 that we need to take every thought captive. But for what reason? Why? To obey Christ. So now we've got it, but we have to make it obey Christ. That's why in the book of James, when he says, be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. We need to capture that thought and then we need to process it so that we're slow to those other things. Because those other things can lead to a desire to say something that will become sin. Which fully grown, we know, turns to death. One of the other examples of God providing a way out is the story of Joseph. You go fast forward to the end of Genesis and we see Joseph, who's son of, who as a, as a son, of, he is a, of many coats and, uh, excuse me, coats of many color. I should know this. This is my youngest son's favorite story, as a matter of fact who his brothers throw him into slavery and sell him into slavery, who later becomes only second highest, only second to, to Pharaoh in the land of Egypt. And when he was a slave in that time, though, poor Joseph was put under huge temptation all the time. He, he was put in as the servant to a man named Potiphar. And Potiphar was his master, and Potiphar had a wife who really, really liked Joseph. She was attracted to him, and she, she wanted to sleep with him. I didn't realize the temptation that Joseph was under all the time to fight to stay pure for the Lord. And the reason I say that is when you read in Genesis 39, 12, the way that God gave him a way out was to run. It says, Joseph escaped and ran outside. Well, there are times when running away is an act of cowardice, but there are times when running a is, an, is evidence of integrity in a person's life. And Joseph is that. He lost his garment by running. And I never realized the persistence of the temptation that was always there for him. It says in verse, in verse 10 of chapter 39 of Genesis, Potiphar's wife spoke to Joseph day after day. So that means every single day, he was confronted by her and he was tempted and he was always reached out to by her. So he could never let his guard down. It was all day, every day long. The temptation posed by this woman was a daily battle in his life. And one, of, one day Joseph found himself in a very dangerous place. He found himself with no other servants around and just him and her. And, and she grabbed him and she pulled him in close and in, in in chapter 39, verses 11 and 12, she says, grabbed him by the garment and told him, sleep with me. Well, Joseph recognized some of the circumstances you know, under the circumstances that called for him running away. Like that's the way God gave him a way out. 
And most of the time, the wise thing is to run from temptation, to not put ourselves even anywhere close to that. But unless there is no way to escape, don't stay in temptation's presence. We can choose to remove ourselves. We can choose to do something else. We can choose to change. It's whether or not we're willing to do it, to accept the reality and to be able to make it. And so here we have Joseph showing us that sometimes you just need to run from it. And that's what we need to do. Avoid the situations that you know are going to be tempting to you. The last thing that I want to use as an example of one of these that God has given a way out is actually when Jesus was tempted himself. And so if you follow along in Matthew 4, Jesus gets baptized and he immediately goes into the wilderness or the desert, whatever your version says, to fast for 40 days and 40 nights and then to be tempted by the devil. So he, he fasts for 40 days and 40 nights and then the devil comes to tempt him. And he tempts him three different times and he holds against it. And this is really important because in Matthew 4.10 it says, he tells, he tells Satan, go away Satan for it is written. Go away, Satan, for it is written. Go away, Satan, for it is written. The lesson here to be learned is is not to simply quote Bible verses, but use them. Well, what does that mean? That means become it. That means live it. That means walk it out in our life. What's the difference? Satan Satan could quote the, the word of God. We know that. As a matter of fact, he did it several times. He actually misquoted it to Jesus in that tempting, and that's why he said, Away with you, Satan, for it is written. And he gave the word of God verbatim in its context to refute the lies of him as the enemy. So that's really what the difference is. He actually, in that misquoting, and that shows us that knowing the Bible and being able to quote it is a helpful defense in resisting the devil eventually or at times in our life. But living by the Bible is really what needs to happen in our life. If we're not going to live it, then all it is is head knowledge. We're still stuck in our minds like we learned before. So the devil knew scripture himself. Like think about it, the devil himself knows scripture and he just chooses not to obey it. So if as people, we know the scriptures and we choose not to obey it, is there much difference in us? It was was in his head, it was in Satan's head, but it wasn't in his heart. So don't just quote the Bible, use it. Use it as Psalm 119 would tell us, 105, as a lamp at your feet and a light for your path. Do you do that? Like there's really actually a lot of practical uses for us to be able to to get out of temptation and use God's word properly in our life in in Psalm 119. As a matter of fact, if you look in, in verse 11, it says, I have treasured your word in my heart so that I may not sin against you. Do you treasure it? Treasure it up in your life. Make it worth something. When it says, I have treasured in my heart, it indicates more than just a memorization of it, just because it indicates a passion for God's word. Not just that passion, that it grows out of a deeper longing for God. And so when we see that, it it is God that we seek in his word. Is it really every time? When you read God's word, do you do it as a checkbox? Do you do it because you know you should? Do you do it because you're looking for something? Or do you do it to seek God himself? Because we should do it to seek him himself. But as we continue to read in these things, we should delight in it. 119 verse 47 says, I delight in your commands, which I love. One who delights in scripture gives his whole energy to not just know it, but also to obey it. But we also need to study it. Verse 15 says, I will meditate on your precepts to think about your ways. We should also pray for understanding because we may not always understand it. Verse 34 says, help me understand your instructions. Why? And I will obey it and follow it with all of my heart. But we should also live it. And that's the last thing 119 shows us in verse 9. How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping your word, it says. And that's my prayer. We will will have temptation all the days of our life. But those desires can be overcome by the strength and the power of the Holy Spirit inside of us. God can protect us in all of those things. But it takes us to not just know his word, 
but to live it. And by living it, then we get the blessings of him in our life and we can overcome. And those desires don't give birth to sin and that sin does not give birth to death. Father God, please protect us all from the temptations and the schemes of the devil. And Lord, it's not about fighting against it in the flesh and blood, but this is a spiritual battle in our life, Lord. Lord, us, Lord let us rest in the word and the promises of your word. But when we read it, let us seek you, but not just seek you to find you, seek you to find you so that we can obey your word and that we can walk out what you have for us so that we know your protection will come. Lord, help us to do that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks for tuning in. I hope you found it to be inspiring. I hope you found it to be challenging. I hope you found a place in this somewhere where the Lord spoke to you directly and that you don't just let it go by, that you actually find out what it is he wants you to do with your life in that. Hope to see you next time.